Well, hey, everybody. I just want to say welcome. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Eastlake, and we're so thrilled that you're here today, whether you're at any of our campuses here in the Seattle region, or uh, I want to say a welcome to those of you who are at our uh, partner and network churches all over the country. We're so honored that we would uh, be able to sort of barge into your community over these weeks, that you'd be joining us on this journey as well. So uh, welcome. We're so glad to share the experience with you. Um, today is an exciting day. I have been... Uh, Gosh, over a year I have been waiting for this moment to introduce you to uh, Dr. Scott Todd, who's going to be with us today. Um, I was actually in Bangui, uh, Central Africa, when I saw this video of this incredible guy teaching some incredible stuff, rocked my world, brought me to tears, and, and just an amazing, it was a sort of a life-changing moment for me when I saw the potential that, uh, that the church has as we partner with God in the world. And so I know that uh, you're going to be inspired today. And so what I'd like to do, uh, you know, I always talk about helping out the guy on video because I feel so vulnerable up here on a screen because you could just throw things at me at any moment and I can't say anything. Uh, why don't you do this? As we get ready to enjoy uh, hearing from Scott, why don't you do this at all campuses and all network churches? Would you do me a great, huge favor of welcoming loudly with great enthusiasm uh, my new friend, Dr. Scott Todd? Would you do that? Welcome him. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan, and uh, great to be with you today. Um, I have heard from Ryan about uh, this series, and I've heard a little bit about what you guys have been doing as a community, as um, the East Lake Community Church and all of the extended campuses. And, uh, you know, I know that in this series you're hearing about God's heart for the poor, you're hearing about Scripture, you're hearing about we've been blessed for reason and that God wants to advance His purposes in the world through us. And, uh, and you're doing that. You know, I know that many of you are uh, sponsoring kids through Compassion International. I know that you've partnered with Charity Water, that you're partnering with IJM. There's amazing stuff that you're doing. And I want you to know that I believe you're part of a global movement, that God is awakening his church to the issues of global poverty and injustice, and he is awakening his church to a full understanding of the good news, a full understanding of the gospel. That is, a gospel that is both proclaimed and demonstrated, one that is both believed and lived out, one that is both something in the mind and, and uh, in a system of belief, but also one that shows up in muscles and changes the world. You're part of an awakening. And uh, to see and hear the testimonies of what's going on through East Lake Community Church is a, is a very encouraging thing. And I'm basically here to affirm you for what you're doing and to share with you some things that will surprise you. Um, you'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be wondering why you haven't heard this before uh, because you've already been engaged, you already understand God's heart for the poor, and you're already taking action. So uh, for me, this journey about, you know, understanding God's heart for the poor began uh, about 25 years ago. I was a college student. I became a Christian through an organization called Young Life. Anybody heard of Young Life out here? Yeah, some hands up. Usually there's a woo-hoo for Young Lifers. Um, I became a Christian late in high school uh, and was pretty much a punk, uh, pretty much an arrogant, um, just didn't care about the rest of the world, didn't know much about the rest of the world. And um, I was a sophomore walking down a campus sidewalk when I saw this poster, and it said, change the life of a child. Now, I'm, I was a cynical kid, frankly. I barely, you know, doubted everything, questioned everything. And um, I walked up to this poster, and I still don't know why, and I stared at it, and I thought, well, you know, I bet this kid doesn't get any of the money. You know, it was one of those things. You cut a check. You, you send some money to ease your guilt about the fact that you have, and they don't. And I'm, I'm looking at this poster and thinking, and I don't have any money anyway. I'm a college student. And I don't even like kids. <laughs> you know, and I'm arguing with this poster, right? And then I finally, you know, as a new Christian, I sort of had this conversational prayer with God. I said, God, do you want me to do this? Now, I did not expect God to respond. <laughs> Most of us don't, right? We, we sort of think the prayers are one-way deal. And uh, suddenly in that moment, I'll never forget it. I, I'm standing in front of this poster, not even sure if I thought of that as a prayer, but I remember saying, God, do you want me to do this? And I just felt compelled. I, I, don't, I couldn't explain it. I felt compelled. I reached out. I pulled off this reply card. I put it in the mail. And a few weeks later, I get this back. This is a picture of a five-year-old boy named Juan Bautista Farias Mora. He lives in the Dominican Republic, and I had just become his sponsor. And I'm looking at this thinking, what did I do? I, um, yeah, looking in his eyes and wondering, where's the Dominican Republic? 
I didn't even know where that was. I had to get out a map. It was embarrassing, you know, when I find out, oh, it's just south of Florida. I should have known that one. But that's where I began, all right? I didn't care about the world, and I didn't have much of a sense of, of uh, you know, of anything, frankly. But through this relationship with Juan Bautista, God really changed my life. And I, I know a lot of you are sponsoring kids with Compassion International. That's what this was for me. It began in 1988. And uh, yeah, back in the day, you know, back in the day, I got married, uh, my wife was much better about writing letters and all of that kind of stuff when you're sponsoring a child. But I remember the day when I could fit all three of my sons in a wheelbarrow, you know, the good old days. And then, I don't know why this surprised me, but the next thing I know, I turn around and they look like this, you know. They, they grow up fast, don't they? And, and it's not like this should surprise us because we're always being told this. Maybe this has happened with your kids, those of you who have kids, and you've, everybody tells you, oh, enjoy those moments. They grow up fast, and you're just trying to survive those, you know, sleepless nights and changing diapers and whatever. But it really is true. The next thing you, you know, they, they grow up, and it's what you want, right? You want them to be taller than you and faster than you and stronger than you and smarter than you and go farther than you, right? Right? That's what I try to convince myself. This is how the uh, end of the races used to look with my son. I, I used to run with um, Micah, my oldest, and, and we would um, run. This was a 5K in Colorado, and uh, it was a proud father-son moment. I'd slow down to run with him. And then there was his first 10K in Boulder, Colorado, celebrating his achievement, a proud father-son moment. So I really should have known that things were changing, that things were just not the same when the end of the race began to look like this. And, <laughs> And yet I managed to remain in denial about that for a good long time. I was, this didn't actually happen. So I think God in his mercy knew I couldn't handle this kid's growing up thing. And he decided to bless us with a late addition. This is Levi. Levi, uh, yeah, eight years after our third son, um, uh, we found out God had this in mind for us. And so a fourth son, Levi Justice Todd. And this is Levi earlier this year on his first day of kindergarten got his backpack on, he is ready to go to school. He is ready to learn and to grow, and he's getting ready for his world. And the question that I want to ask you is, what will Levi's world look like? What will be normal for him? What will be his technologies? You know, we've all seen these changes. What will be normal for his culture? What will be normal for his church? All those things that we think are normal, just this is how it is, what will Levi's world be look like? Even his attitude toward the poor, even his engagement with the poor. I need to tell you about a place where half of the children, where 20% of the children die before their fifth birthday. It's a place where most young women will watch at least one of their children die. They die from things like waterborne disease, they die for a lack of food security. Almost half the population lives in extreme economic poverty, life without basic needs met. I'm talking about the United States of America. That's right, not that long ago, only about 200 years ago, that's where we were, but things began to change with new technologies, with rail transportation and telecommunications, the invention of electricity, mechanized agriculture and increased food production, new transportation technologies and uh, air travel and vaccines and satellites, and I was born, and uh, computers and cell phones and servers and the hybrid cars and the pinnacle of all technology, the iPhone. <laughs> things have come a long way, but sadly, that progress has not reached all of us yet. And I had this personal experience that confronted, that, uh, confronted me with that truth in Tanzania seven years ago. I was director of Compassion's HIV AIDS initiative in Africa. And the reason that I was in Tanzania specifically was because while our other East African countries were successfully um, procuring antiretroviral medicines, the, the drugs that stop HIV, uh, we'd had some real struggles in Tanzania. And in this community, uh, we had 53 children who were infected with HIV uh, at birth and uh, who needed those medicines or else they would die. And that is why I was visiting with Jacqueline because she was one of those 53 children. She was born with HIV. She watched both her mother and her father die uh, with this disease. Um, it's an excruciating, brutal, and long death. And um, it's something that no child should have to endure seeing um, and needless to say, when she then fell sick, after, after her parents died and she was taken into the home of her grandmother, uh, and she was told, you've got the sickness. 
she knew she would die like her parents. I knelt next to Jacqueline in that dirt, and I prayed for her, but I prayed with a hope and an optimism because just the day before, we had succeeded. We'd finally found a clinic through which we could secure these medicines, and I knew that Jacqueline was one of those 53 kids that we were going to start uh, that antiretroviral therapy the very next day. So I knelt in that dirt and I prayed that God let these medicines bring her back because uh, she had progressed very rapidly. And, and just as I'd seen with hundreds of other kids, I was praying, Lord, let us hear her sing, let's watch her play, let's see what you had in mind when you built her. And so the next day she uh, began the therapy at the clinic and I, uh, I headed back to the United States. And when I arrived back in the United States, was, it was two days later, I had a message from our Tanzania office saying, Jacqueline is dead. You see, we missed the opportunity to save her life, maybe by only a day. Those medicines, they, they require a certain basic strength in the body, sort of like starting chemotherapy. And uh, we'd gotten her there and we'd started, but we were too late. And that, I don't know why, um, it's been Jacqueline. I've been with a lot of kids who've died. I've been with a lot of kids who've been abused and abandoned through my work with compassion. But for some reason, it's Jacqueline's voice that I still hear, and it's her memory. Um, I've had a lot of sleepless nights. And in those sleepless nights, there was one particular night where I was remembering her, and then there was sort of this strange shift where it felt like instead of remembering her, I, I sensed that she was present. And um, I know this might sound strange, but I made a promise that I will do whatever I can with whatever influence God grants to never be too late again. Not just for the kids with HIV, but for all of them. And that's really why I'm here. I'm here to honor that promise because I don't think we need to be too late. Every day, 21,000 children die of preventable causes, things like dirty water, malaria, vaccine-preventable diseases. These kids are among the 1.4 billion people living in extreme economic poverty. But let me interrupt us here and ask you something. What did you expect? A guy's going to come talk about extreme poverty. You probably expect to hear sad stories. You expect to hear bleak, overwhelming statistics, right? I mean, it's sort of what we expect to hear. Let me ask you a really important question. What are your expectations for the future of the poor? When your children are your age, do you think that they'll be sitting in a place like this hearing similar sad stories and bleak, overwhelming statistics? What are your expectations for the future of the poor? You know, I recently spoke at a uh, pastor's conference, and I asked these pastors and church leaders, write down, this was before I spoke, I had these uh, index cards on all the chairs, I said, write down one verse from the Bible about poverty or about the poor. Okay, you know, all these pastors, you know, I mean, there's hundreds of verses to choose from. Some people think there's thousands. And uh, I, I'm wondering, what do you think is the most common, the, the most often remembered passage from Scripture about the poor? Of all of those many hundreds of verses that could be chosen and written down, the most often remembered verse is this one. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. I believe that a misinterpretation of this verse anchors a fatalistic belief that poverty is unsolvable. So we need to look in the context. We need to look at what happened. Jesus said these words at a party three days before his death. He was in the town of Bethany just outside of Jerusalem three days before his death, and Mary comes in and anoints him with a $45,000 jar of perfume. And Judas, you know, the greedy little treasurer, he's there, he sees that money dripping on the dirt, and he objects. He says, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price, and the money given to the poor. What a perfect argument. So he's attacking Mary. And in that moment of tender worship and, and Ju Judas's attack, Jesus steps in and says, leave her alone. He defends Mary. You'll always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. But wait a second. You'll always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. But later he says, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So which is it? Why do we treat the first half of this sentence like an all-time proclamation, like he's standing behind a podium on a second seminar on economic development, and we put the second half in context? I mean, who is the you? If you examine this incident... And it's there in John 12, but it's also in Mark 14 and in Matthew 26. Read those three accounts of that incident and put yourself in the scene and use, use the imagination to see what's really going on. 
Mary comes in actually imitating the act of a prostitute who at some point earlier had done the same thing in anointing Jesus with this expensive perfume. And Jesus says, this was done to prepare me for my burial. It's a beautiful, tender moment of worship, lavish worship of Jesus, just moments before he faces the cross. And greed, embodied in Judas, objects. And greed is arguing, we could give this money to the poor. And John makes it clear, he didn't say it because he cared about the poor. He said it because he was keeper of the purse and he used to help himself to what was put in it. In that moment, Jesus says, you can help the poor anytime you want. You'll always have those opportunities. I'm about to die. It troubles me that our Christian leaders would have that top of mind when there's so many other passages of Scripture that could come to mind. It makes you wonder why. What, what is making that one stand out, especially when it so clearly does not align with everything else Jesus taught about the poor? You know, I was in Haiti just after the earthquake, uh, leading a medical response team there. And... Uh, I mean, Haiti was a disaster before the earthquake, right? I mean, a place of really dire poverty, but in the aftermath of that earthquake, it was just, it was, if, if there's any place on earth, any time, that somebody would be justified for being hopeless, just having like no sense of possibility about the future, it'd be there and then. And I asked this Haitian man, in the aftermath of that earthquake, do you think it's possible to bring an end to this extreme poverty, this kind of poverty that we see all around us? You know what, he didn't hesitate. He said, oh yeah, it's possible. And he went on and explained what he thought could be done. I mean, it was amazing. A few months after that, I was in rural Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is a place that's seen famine and hardship and political oppression. And I asked a rural Ethiopian man that same question, do you think it's possible to bring an end to extreme economic poverty? He didn't hesitate either. He said yes, and he went on to explain how he thought that could happen. I come back to the United States, and I meet with atheists and agnostics who are economists and who say that they think it's possible to bring an end to extreme economic poverty, not just someday, in our day. And yet when I meet with uh, Christians and church leaders, I tend to hear a little bit of a different answer. I tend to get a kind of a, well, uh, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think we should help the poor. I just, if we go saying stuff like that, it's just going to come back to bite us. It just doesn't sound realistic. How is it possible that those of us who believe in an all-powerful God, those of us who believe that with God all things are possible, those of us who believe that his scripture is filled with commands that his people would care for the poor, those of us who read those scriptures and see that God clearly, deeply loves the poor, and a God who has resourced us with incredible wealth and means and knowledge and experience and even time to take action upon those commands, that we would be the skeptics, that we would be the ones saying, I don't know. That troubles me. When I think of Scripture, and there are so many other passages that we could turn to, the one chapter of Scripture that stands out to me is the one I'd like to focus on today with you. It's Isaiah 58. It's really the entire chapter. I'm not going to take the time to go through the whole chapter, but I'm going to give a broad overview of what happens in Isaiah 58. It begins with these words, Shout it aloud and do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. And declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. I mean, it's a prophet, you know. They do this kind of thing. They're not the kind of guy you and I invite over for dinner. He's a bit irritated, right? I mean, um, we just heard Ryan talking earlier about um, holy discontent. Um, I can't stand it no more, you know, the Popeye kind of thing. There are things. Well, I think Isaiah had that going on here. He, he had this message God had given him. Declare this message. Shout it aloud. And what is this message? What's, what, what are the people doing that's so ticks them off, this prophet. For day after day, they seek me out. Huh? They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. Daily seeking God is this big sin? Basically, the first message in Isaiah 58 is, I've seen your religious show and I'm not impressed. He's talking to the people of God saying, I've seen it. I, you've got your fasting. You've got all this stuff going on. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. The prophet is warning the people of God. I'm not even listening to your prayers, and that's a very dangerous place to be. Now, a lot of us have heard criticism of the church, and um, frankly, some of us get pretty tired of it because we think, you know, I'm not just not sure that's us. I mean, you know, maybe a little bit of it's true, but... Um, 
the true prophet never stops there. Somebody who is calling out hypocrisy or calling out a problem in the church could be speaking prophetically to us, but I don't believe the true prophet ever ends there with this critique, with this kind of heckling, and then they move on because Isaiah doesn't. Because Isaiah's heart burns with a passion to see God's people living the way God designed them to live. And so he turns to articulate that alternative vision of the future the other way. He says, is not this the fast I have chosen? Is not this the fast I have chosen? This is in verse 6. To loose the chains, to untie the cords of the yoke and set the oppressed free. Isn't it to provide food for the hungry and share, uh, provide shelter for the poor wanderer? When you see the naked to clothe him and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. He shows that God's true religion, very much like it says in James, is about caring for those who are hurting, specifically the poor and oppressed. But it doesn't end there either because Isaiah 58 continues to say, if you do this, this isn't about duty and guilt and, you know, that kind of stuff. If you do this, then the promise is gone. So read the last third of Isaiah 58, and you will just be overwhelmed with these promises. It says, if you live this way, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. You will call out, and I will say, here I am. In the beginning, of it, we're told, you can't fast this way and expect your voice to be heard. I'm not even listening to your prayers. And then he says, you will call out, I'll be right there promises you will find your joy. It's the stuff we're praying for. I mean, all of us, we want to find joy. We want his guidance. We want his protection. He says, the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. I got you covered if you will live this way. So Isaiah 58 for me embodies this entire message about God's heart for his people that we would be done with religious performances and engage in living out uh, the kind of life he's called us to live, together in community, making a difference in the world, and specifically in responding to the needs of the poor and oppressed. It is time for us to remember our amazing legacy. It's time for us to join with men like Martin Luther King Jr. who once said that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability it comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. Now, the data I'm about to show you will surprise you. You'll wonder why you haven't seen them before. Uh, and uh, that's part of the fun of this message. Um, you know, we could look at a lot of numbers. We could look at a lot of trends. And I know you're thinking, this is a church, and this is data, and I don't think this is right. This seems like university. Trust me, it's very cool data. It's like worship data. Okay. Uh, we, we know about the United States. We know about our story. Did you know that in 1900, the average life expectancy in the United States was only 49 years? In 1900, so a century ago, and today we're at 79 years. So that's not too surprising to us. We know our story. We know about the progress we've seen here. But what about other places like India and China? Did you know in China, the average life expectancy in 1900 was only 24 years? Can you imagine that? I mean, I'd be dead. You got, like, just got your college degree. All right. Time to die. Okay, so in the past century, though, India is up to 64 years and China is up to 73 years. These countries have more than doubled their average lifespan in the past century. That's incredible progress. What about really hard places, places like Ethiopia? In 1900, the average life expectancy in Ethiopia was only 30 years, and today it's 56. Even Ethiopia has nearly doubled the average length of their lives. And a big part of the reason for this improvement in average lifespan is improvement in child survival rates. You know, we used to say that 40,000 children die every day from hunger and preventable diseases. 40,000 every day. In the 90s, that number dropped to 33,000, and today we're down to 21,000. We have cut in half the number of children who are dying of poverty-related causes before their fifth birthday. And we did that in a span of a generation. A big part of the reason those kids are living longer and surviving to see their fifth birthday is because they now have access to safe drinking water. Did you know that just in the past 20 years, 600 million people have gained access to safe drinking water? Waterborne disease used to be the number one killer of kids under the age of five, past tense. And when you do what you do to provide clean water, it matters. We're seeing an incredible progress in the fight to provide clean water and save lives. What about uh, measles as an example of a vaccine-preventable disease? You know, we don't think much about measles in the United States. We invented a vaccine for that like 40 years ago. Doesn't seem like a big deal. But in the year 2000, three-quarters of a million kids, 750,000 kids, died of measles globally in the year 2000. 
But look what happened between 2000 and 2008. There has been a 78% reduction in the number of kids dying from measles simply because we're completing the work of immunizing those kids. What about malaria? Malaria is a major killer of children. Almost a million kids die every year from this disease. Seems like a massive, unsolvable, overwhelming problem. Did you know that between 2002 and 2008, only six years' time, 22 countries cut their malaria rates in half? And they did it through simple interventions, things like insecticide-treated nets and better medicines and spraying to kill mosquitoes, strategies that we know work and they are working. Those are all in the health area. What about literacy? Look what's happened in terms of education over the past century. Back in 1870, 25% of the world's population could read. By 1950, that was 50%, and by 2000, it was 83%. Education is climbing along with health. Look at malnutrition rates. Did you know in 1970, 36% of the world's population, one-third of us were malnourished? But look what's been happening. In 1990, that drops to 20%, and by 2004, it's at 16%. We are making incredible progress on almost every front in almost every country. But if you're only going to remember one set of numbers from what I'm sharing with you, remember this, 52 to 26 and 26 to go. In 1981, 52% of the world's population lived in extreme economic poverty. That's life on less than a dollar and a quarter a day. 52%, half of us. And now we're down to 26. We have cut in half the, num the percentage of people living in extreme economic poverty, and we did that in the span of about 25 years. The question is, what will it take to get to zero? What will it take to finish the job? What will it take to lift the last 26%? The answer is that it continues with you. The last 26% is going to be harder than the first. The drops that we've seen have been driven by forces that they will continue, but it's going to get harder. But there is no question that we can finish this job. There is no question. So when you encounter skepticism, you tell them you, you maybe just don't know the data. Share some of that with them. Uh, we have a website called live58.org, and you can find data there. There's a book called Fast Living. It uh, summarizes some of that data in a pretty easily read way. We need to move the needle from this place of uninformed pessimism to a place of informed optimism or hope. The belief that it's possible isn't just because we believe in an all-powerful God, which of course we do. It's because we're just not naive to the data. When we find ourselves feeling what God feels, when we wake up to the reality that we're living in a world where kids are dying of preventable causes, while those of us who bear the name of Jesus Christ have been given unprecedented wealth, and while all the evidence shows us that this is possible in our generation, that this could be the generation to finish this task, we will become indignant. We will become impatient. We will be compelled to join in the kind of work you're already doing. And you want to shine. You want to shine. You want to take the example of what you're doing and share it with others and say, this matters and I know it matters. There's a couple stories I want to finish as I wrap up. I, uh, uh, from that moment on that sidewalk on that campus in Texas where I uh, wound up sponsoring that little boy, I remember Juan Bautista, from the Dominican Republic. I, um, I'd gone on, I had a career in medical research. Uh, I, I was involved in uh, cancer and immunology work um, for a number of years. And kind of in the middle of all of that, um, I received a very clear calling from God to leave that and join Compassion International. And, um, and I was trying to make sense of that. Honestly, I, I felt like, Lord, why if you want me, I mean, this was to a position that had nothing to do with my background in immunology or, or you know, HIV and stuff. It was, it was for relational ministry. <laughs> and I said, I'm a scientist. <laughs> Everybody knows we've got no relational skills and uh, about as far from ministry as you can get. So, but I felt like God was calling me. So I, I stepped through these, um, you know, interviews and stuff with Compassion International and they, um, they offered me the position. And the next thing I know, they said, uh, get your passport and visa in order because we have a conference next month and it's in the Dominican Republic. I said, oh, I know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, the first kid I ever sponsored, he's in the Dominican Republic. Is a chance I could meet him? She said, um, yeah, well, is he still in the program? I said, no, he's probably been out for a few years. And she said, well, and she gave me like 10 reasons, including like he may not want to meet you. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, okay, it's no big deal. I just thought to ask and so. 
So it was a Friday night, I was at this conference in Santo Domingo, and a Compassion staff person from the DR came up to me and said, are you Scott Todd? I said, yeah. He said, Juan Bautista's coming here tomorrow. Uh, he became a Christian two days ago. And I'm, I'm just feeling like, wow, wow. I mean, I don't even know what to say. So the next day, this little van pulls up, and, and there's a number of us at the conference, and some of them are currently sponsoring other kids. So these little kids are getting out of the van, and they're like wide-eyed looking at, you know, these sponsors over here, and they're like, the sponsor's real, and you will turn and look at the sponsors, they're all wide-eyed going, the kid is real, you know. It's a pretty incredible moment. And then this good-looking 19-year-old young man steps out of the van, holding in his hands the letters that I had written him 15 years earlier. And I got to spend the day with Juan. And when the time came, I said, Juan, what happened two days ago that you'd become a Christian? His answer was, I never thought you'd come. It had been his childhood prayer that his sponsor would be able to visit him. And for me, I'm, I'm like praying, God, show me a sign. This is really what you called me to do. And, and I really felt like God showed up in that moment to say, just be faithful. Just be faithful to go where I call you to go. I'm doing things you don't see. And I think that's got to be a message for some of you today. Don't try to make sense of it. A lot of times God's will makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. One other quick story to finish. I, uh, I told you about Jacqueline. I told you about how um, difficult that moment was for me. Well, I had written her a letter. I had written this letter that um, I intended to send uh, bring with, with me to Tanzania and I was going to read it at her graveside because I wasn't able to attend her funeral and I wanted to give a gift to her grandmother who had cared for her and so I'd written this letter and like three years goes by and uh, I just for a lot of different reasons wasn't getting back to Tanzania, a number of other African countries but finally the opportunity comes and so I've tried to coordinate that with this particular um, uh, plan and there were some misunderstandings. And on the day that I was planning on going to Jacqueline's grave and reading this letter uh, and delivering this gift, I instead was on this home visit. And um, with a small group of people, we were visiting, um, you know, learning about the life of what it's like to be in poverty and so on. And not everybody could fit into these little homes. And so uh, I decided to stand outside. And as I'm standing outside this home, and there's this sort of open uh, area in front of this little house, um, I see this little girl, and she's got this pink balloon. And she's bumping this balloon up in the air, you know, and trying to keep it from hitting the ground. And it's kind of fun to watch. And, uh, and then she bumps this balloon, and this breeze kicks up and blows the balloon right over to me. And so I get down and hit it and knock it back over to her, and she knocks it back to me. And we're just playing, bumping this balloon back and forth, and I'm smiling, and she's smiling. And it's just this beautiful moment until I bump the balloon, and it drifts right up on top of this rusty, corrugated chicken coop with barbed wire wrapped around it. And I'm like, oh, Lord, please don't let it pop. That'd be perfect. The white guy shows up and pops the girl's balloon, you know. And thankfully it didn't. It kind of bounced around and then it landed on the ground. I picked it up and I handed it to her. And as she took it from me, she looked me straight in the eyes and she said, thank you. And I felt these chills. I felt like the sense of a presence or something in that moment. And I, uh, there was a woman standing nearby. I said, tell me about this, um, this little girl. And the woman said, uh, well, this little girl is 12 years old, the same age that Jacqueline was. And uh, she was born with HIV. Both of her parents died, and she was taken into the home of her grandmother. I mean, it was just like Jacqueline's story. And turns out that this little girl was one of those 53 kids on that list from three years earlier. Now, you got to understand, Compassion has 30,000 children in our program in Tanzania alone. And so this just felt like God had arranged a different day for me a different appointment for me. I went there with an expectation to stand at a graveside, and God had an expectation that I would play with this little girl and not even know. And then I asked this woman, so what's her name? And she said, her name's Jacqueline. This was the other Jacqueline who goes by Jackie. God shows up in moments that we don't plan and don't expect, and he speaks to us in exactly the way we need to. When we are down, when we expect to be at a graveside, he has something else in mind. Be alert. Be expecting him to speak. And in that moment, what God said to me is, you do not have to be too late. Let me pray for us. 
Lord, we are so grateful to be your people, so grateful that you have called us, that you have forgiven us, God, that you have shown us the way to true life in Jesus Christ. Lord, we're grateful for all the blessings in our lives, for the way that you've protected us, for, for our health, and for God's safe water to drink and, and good food to eat. And Lord, we know that your heart breaks for all of those people in the world who don't have those basic needs met. And we know that your scriptures are full of commands that we would be your people representing and being who you called us to be, responding to those needs. God, I pray that you will break our hearts so that our heart can be like yours. I pray that you will speak to people right here, right now, the exact words you need them to hear. Show them the action that they should take personally. And God, in our faithfulness, will you do miracles? Allow us to witness you at work. Allow us to see lives rescued. Allow us to see the church strengthened. Allow us to see little kids play with pink balloons and grow up and have a shot at a good life, the kind of life you meant for them to have, not the life that gets destroyed by the forces of evil in this world. God, I pray your blessing. I pray your courage. I pray your strength upon each one here. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much, Scott, and uh, why don't we all thank Scott for being here across all campuses and network churches. Um, before you jump down, I just wanted to give people a second, of course, to write down uh, the URL if they didn't get a chance, and maybe if you had a couple other ideas of how they could, um, you know, participate if they felt tugged in that way. Yeah, well, I know, I know you guys were already engaged in so many ways. I mean, really, it's just, uh, it's just do those things that you have studied or you feel called to do um, that you think are effective. Um, for me personally, I shared a story about sponsoring kids. I've been sponsoring kids with compassion for 25 years. I've never had a day where I regretted that decision. I mean, it is, um, it is one of those things that I've looked at so closely. I know it works and uh, it's a great experience. So that's what I encourage people to do yeah. personally. The other thing that we are calling people to do is to find out what it means to live 58. Uh, and that's really a movement where all of us together, uh, we believe that God can move through us together to bring an end to extreme poverty. So check that out at live58.org. Awesome. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I've mentioned a couple times over the years uh, that my wife and I have been sponsoring Kids Through Compassion for many years as well. And we have a, a, a kid, as each one of our children gets old enough, we uh, get them another kid and they actually think that they're sponsoring the kid, which is untrue. Uh, but their meager allowance does go partially to, uh, to that. And uh, I was able to be in Ecuador with uh, Compassion uh, last year, and that was an incredible experience. And, you know, your story of uh, when he, he had all those letters yeah. uh, just really hit home for me because I remember when, uh, when kids would tell us stories about, you know, sometimes when some kids don't get those letters, it can be really painful. And I just wanted to even take a second because I know there's a lot of people here at Eastlake and I'm sure at the network churches where people who are sponsoring kids and I just wanted to encourage you uh, in, in the po most positive way I can make sure that you don't uh, underestimate the power of those letters I mean it's great to to uh, be able to give education and food but the the emotional health that comes as a result of receiving those letters as yeah, you absolutely heard in story, true it's so true so powerful no last thing I wanted to yeah. I wanted to pump was um, uh, the uh, packet, the DVD and the book packet that I just wanted to mention, especially to those of you at the network churches, that if you go to uh, live58.org, can they get the whole packet there? It's a yeah, great little... Yeah, you can little, request it there. And, so it's like a small yeah. group curriculum. It's like yep. three weeks, right? And that yep. you can go through. And if you're interested in doing that, I would highly recommend doing so. My group's going through it uh, right now as well. So again, let's thank Scott one more time. Thank you for thank being you. here. Thanks, Thanks man. man. Appreciate it. I want to, at this time, turn at our network churches, turn it over to uh, your pastor. Thanks again for joining us for this series. And then at all of our Eastlake campuses right now, would you uh, take out that blue card in your program at this time? And if you're an usher at any of our campuses right now, why don't you prepare at this time uh, to receive those blue cards as well as the giving in just a moment. Uh, but if you just flip to the back side of that blue card uh, uh, right now, we just want to take a moment to reflect. Uh, and just really ask God's Spirit to speak to us at an individual level. We say this all the time around here, but we really believe uh, that the world is sick of religious groups of people who claim to believe a list of ideas when those ideas don't translate into any kind of personal transformation, when they don't make us into more beautiful human beings. And so it's our hope that we would sort of pause and reflect and meditate on what God's Spirit has been speaking to us and then take action based on that. 
And uh, so just encourage you to do that at this time, and there's a lot of options there. Maybe if you have a prayer request, you could put that down on there. And then on the I will, there's a uh, I will statement on the bottom with a blank. And maybe there's something specific that God spoke to you. Maybe it's, I'm going to sponsor a kid through compassion or something else. But uh, you just encourage you to write that down. We'll be praying for those uh, spiritual commitments that you make uh, each week. At this time, uh, ushers, you can begin receiving the blue cards as well as the giving. And if you came prepared to give today, you can drop that in the uh, buckets as they pass. If you're a guest with us, once again, just please take a pass on the offering. We did not invite you here to be a part of uh, our family today and then ask you for money. This is for those who call Eastlake uh, their church home. And as ushers are doing that, and we're wrapping up here, I'd like you to watch this. <laughs> 